Thank you. I can actually do one better than uh, lawyers that uh, understand programming languages because I'll have an example of a language designed by a lawyer. So we'll see. All right. So I want to talk about um, a language stack for implementing contracts. And I consciously didn't say smart contracts. Of course, they play a role. But the picture is a little bit bigger or different. So context. If you look at the term smart contract, it started historically essentially as an actual contract running on a blockchain so that the focus was really on typical use cases for smart uh, for blockchains are or were contract kind of stuff but it kind of morphed over to mean any Turing complete program that runs on a blockchain right so if you look at solidity it's a general purpose programming language with a couple of extensions for the blockchain infrastructure but there is nothing in it that that makes it specifically suitable for implementing actual contracts and I'll get back to what this is in a moment so I want to go back to the notion of smart contracts as a means of actually running contracts so a contract I would define as something where multiple parties collaborate in making a decision, an agreement, or coordinate something somehow. And then once they agree on the contract and execute it, meaning they sign it and make it kind of go live, then this is legally binding and trusted. Of course, it depends, you know, there are shades of gray how binding it is depending on how you make the contract, but still, generally, that's the case. And um, if you want to, uh, execute contracts automatically, I don't know, can this be seen that automatically is highlighted, yes, then you need to describe them in a way so that a machine can interpret them. So taking a typical document, like a typical contract expressed in prose, I mean, it's hardly understandable for non-lawyers. It's certainly not understandable for machines. So that's, that's a no-go. So we need to do this differently. There's actually a funny story. I was working for uh, Charles Simoni's company a long while ago. Um, and he had a lawyer on staff, and that lawyer had been working in the computer science industry, software industry for years, and he, he treated contract writing as programming. So he, 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 really tr he really tried to cover all cases systematically, looking for synonyms, and he really tried to make it watertight. It was a very interesting uh, guy. Anyway. I digress. So if we look at um, contracts, then there are two phases, by the way, like with any program. But specifically for contracts, you have the contract definition phase, and then you have a contract execution phase. And in the definition phase, you have a bunch of parties, usually lawyers or people like that, um, meaning no pro non-programmers, who have to agree on what the contract is supposed to do. So there is no need for crypto and any of this. It's just making sure we all understand what actually the contract does if it's if, when it's going to be executed. Right? So that's, that's step one. So the, the behavior expressed in the contract must be understandable to those people who care. Again, usually not programmers. And so we have to then also verify some notion of functional correctness. So for example, if we say, um, if the ship you just leased isn't returned within X months in a working state, then you have to pay some kind of fine, right? You have to be sure that there isn't a loophole where you can kind of damage the ship and still not pay because the contract has some other clause somewhere else that expresses that in some strange circumstance you don't have to pay the fine, right? So this would be the notion of functional correctness. If you treat it as a state machine, right, there are certain constraints on liveness and non-deadlocks and temporal properties that say for every execution of the state machine, it's guaranteed that, right? So this is what needs to be done here. And then, of course, once you execute it, that's where um, these, let's say, blockchain-y kind of things come in, where you can guarantee through crypto and, you know, all these agreement protocols that he just talked about, Stefan just talked about, um, so you can't game it, right? So assuming the specified behavior is correct to all parties involved, make sure that the actual software system that runs this enforces this, does it correctly, and you kind of use crypto stuff to prove that you actually, you know, I don't know, submitted something, paid something, whatever. Once you have these two, then you can trust, right? It doesn't help if you have a correct execution infrastructure, but you have a contract with a loophole. 
I don't mean a software bug. I mean an actual logic f fault, right? So this is really important, in my opinion, to understand because, again, blockchains only help with this, right? They help with this notion of non-repudiability. -repudi so you, once you've done something, you have done it because it's in the blockchain and everybody knows it and everybody can repeat the calculation that got to this point, blah, 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 blockchain, 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 right? And it helps to some degree um, to verify the behavior, meaning it kind of guarantees that if it's kind of programmed correctly, it runs correctly. I'll get back to that. So again, blockchains, in my opinion, are a way to provide certain non-functional properties to contracts. And with non-functional, I mean they don't relate to the actual behavior, they provide illities, right? Usually, in this case, security and, you know, the usual quality attributes. And so blockchains are a suitable, maybe partial implementation technology for actual contracts if these non-functional properties are needed. For example, if for whatever reason you have to trust some kind of central entity in the real world anyway, because, I don't know, they own the ship you lease, right? If they sell you a ship with a big hole in it, you're going to sink and die, right? So you're going to trust this company. So you could argue you don't need a distributed blockchain-style system to do the kind of legal thing, you can just also trust them with that and put the contract with a bunch of signatures onto their servers, right? You, you might be able to make that argument, right? So it really depends on the context how much of these blockchain guarantees you need. And of course, different blockchain technologies also provide different levels of trust. Again, these various proof of work, stake, whatever, they provide different levels of trust. And again, depending on what you want to do, this might be enough. All right. so. We have a verification problem and we have a validation problem. The verification problem is assuming the contract is specified in a correct way, does the blockchain, the you know, whatever, Ethereum distributed VM, execute it correctly, make sure there aren't any bugs, no loopholes. I mean, there have been a couple of famous ones, right? Um, stuff like that. Um, and then we have a validation problem, which is to make sure that the uh, contract functionally actually behaves as we expect. This is, by the way, nothing new. Every software program has that problem, right? You do validation, make sure it does the right things, and verification, make sure it does these things the right way. So, and this neatly maps on these two phases. A validation is what you do during contract definition, right? The lawyers agree and understand, and verification uh, refers or relates to the execution of the contract, so it kind of faithfully executes what's specified. So that's the big picture. In order to do these things, there are generally two ways. There is correct by construction and analysis and fix. Correct by construction means you take a language, maybe that one has to be invented, whatever, that doesn't allow you to make certain mistakes, right? So. Simple example, if a language doesn't have null, then you can't run into null pointer exceptions, right? So you, for example, use option types, and the type system enforces that you always check if something is nothing or something, and because the type system checks that you cannot make, uh, you cannot run into null pointer exception. And if you do, it's a verification issue of the lower level that somehow the type checker is broken, which you assume not to happen because, you know, compilers don't have bugs. Um, Asymptotically over time, that's true. Um, and analysis and fix is you um, write a program and then you analyze and show that this particular program doesn't have certain bugs. Again, you can run whatever checker over your Java program, which does have null values, but it still does an analysis that shows in this particular program, it's guaranteed that for all possible executions, null pointer exceptions won't happen, right? Whether this is easy, Expensive, costly, possible at all, depends on the language. Um, so again, um, for correct by construction, you need a suitable language. For analysis and fix, you need a suitable tool. And you can do, of course, you can combine both. I'll get back to that. And this applies also here to the, to the uh, kind of contract context. So point, of course, as you already said in the introduction, a domain-specific language that lets you express contracts in a way that's more understandable to, you know, non-programmers, um, that langu a language that has certain properties, meaning you can't make certain mistakes, 
And maybe the language is designed in a way so that it simplifies certain analyses to identify other problems you can't constructively rule out. Right? So this is kind of the direction I'm thinking slash prototyping. Yeah, we don't need this one. So before I'm going to show you code, running code, um, I want to put this a little bit into context because, oops, I didn't put an animation there. Hmm. Um, there is lots of history and research in this whole story of computational law, where people think about how can, how can you make contracts uh, you know, formally described and then uh, executable by programs. And um, if you look at papers in this area, you will see that they have notions of obligation and permission, like you have to pay X within Y deadline, and if you do that, an obligation, then you get the permission to use the ship, right? Stuff like that. And then there are all kinds of clauses that if you don't do this within this deadline, you get an additional thing you have to pay, and if you do this a bit earlier, you get more permissions and stuff like that. These all interact somehow. And then there is the notion of ordering, like things have to happen in a particular order. Um, there is causality, like if this doesn't happen, then this other thing happens. Of course, there's the notion of time, and then when you actually execute the contract, there is things like events where you say, okay, once you make the payment, the running contract goes into another state, and then in that state, you now are allowed to do other things. So that's kind of what all of these uh, systems have in common, and um, we can now all pause and read all these papers. Um, you can do this offline, of course, so there is various things, some of them uh, old, others more recent, and if you're interested in some of these things, then you might want to check this out. I'll give you a concrete example of a language that's based on, uh, where's the poets thing? Here. That's based on the ideas from poets. So this is all pre-blockchain, right? Nothing to do with blockchains, which kind of reinforces this idea that blockchains are implementation technologies for certain non-functional properties and not the enabler of computational law. All right, so. The next few slides propose, if you will, a language stack. That's also the title of the presentation, so I guess it's supposed to be one. Um, about how a bunch of languages could look like to, to make something like that work. So I've started implementing something which, of course, everything has to have a name. It's the executable multi-party contract language. Um, right, whatever, name. Um, I'll demo that in a moment. And on top of that, you could imagine building various specific languages for contracts in certain domains. Um, I'll show an example from logistics that a friend of mine has built or prototyped. Um, we have built languages in the finance space, but they were not based on this. So there's like pieces all over the place. Um, there's also a research project in Hamburg going on where the Hamburg's logistics community has approached the IT community, uh, help us. You know, IBM is trying to make us use their own blockchain thing. We want to build something open. Please help us. You know, so there is uh, a research project going on there. So and then in this particular system that I've built, this prototype, this EMPCL is built on a language called kernel F, which is a functional programming language implemented in MPS. It's highly extensible, which is good because it can extend it in ways that kind of make it the EMPCL. And then on this level, you can do validation, you can do simulation, you can play with these contracts, you can simulate them, and you can, um, you know, you have a nice expressive language to have state-based behavior and also address some you know, gaming issues. Uh, show that in a moment. And then you can um, map these to various different um, blockchains. I haven't implemented this, just to be clear, but uh, we kind of looked at this, talked to the Ethereum guys. There is this Yulia language, which is, if you will, the uh, Ethereum assembly. Well, it's a be between the actual machine code and Solidity. It's this language called Yulia. And um, there are, of course, other blockchains as well, and because these contracts are specified independent of a particular implementation language, you can map them to different ones through code generation, old story, nothing new. And then you can also map all of this to, for example, Z3. Anybody who knows Z3? Okay, it's an SMT solver, meaning it's a formalism based on which you can make certain proofs about your program. And we are currently in the process of mapping all of this complete stack onto Z3. 
Uh, this is actually paid by this research project in Hamburg. I don't know if the project knows that they pay for this, but as with usual, eh, whatever. Uh, this should be cut out. <laughs> yes, I'm sorry. Um, no, I mean, of course, it's part of the story. Um, so the, the idea is in this project to build uh, a logistics language for Frachtbriefe, right? Uh, I don't know what the English word is for this. Thank you. Say that again. Okay, all right. Um, and then to use this mapping to verify certain properties, model checking, stuff like that. So I'm going to show you a demo of this. Um, here. So here is a declarative specification of um, a decision taken by a group of people. The group of people are Bunt and Markus. Um, Bunt is the guy who sits in the office uh, opposite of, my, of me. There's also going to be a close and a Tamash there in the office next door. Um, and this thing here is a declaration of a behavior. So it says, these two people make a decision, and the decision here is, essentially a yes, no, a Boolean, right? Do we do this or don't we do this? So it's the simplest decision you can make. You don't have to agree on a value or something or a price. Only say yes, no. Um, and then you can specify what the procedure should be to make this decision. Should it be a unanimous decision or a majority decision or even, you know, some custom thing where I could say that it doesn't matter as long as Marcus agrees, it's voted for it. Right? Marcus is always a good guy, right? You'll notice. And yeah, whatever. Um, then you can um, say that there needs to be a minimum turnout. Like there have to be X number of people or all who actually vote, right? Um, then you can specify a time limit. Like this decision has to be made in X amount of time. If it isn't made, then the decision is invalid by default false, right? Um, you can say whether a vote that somebody did is revocable, right? I'm voting, voting for that decision. Can I, within the time limit, if any, say, oh, sorry, I didn't vote. Let's, let's revoke, revoke this. And this is, a, again, a, a declarative specification of the expected behavior. And um, implementing this procedurally in any language, I mean, it's not rocket science, but it's it is error prone. I mean, these interactions between time limits and majorities and stuff, it's not totally trivial. Um, and so now we can play with this. We can create an instance of one of these guys, for example, here. And let's open it in the, the REPL, right? So that's the interactive REPL. Uh, here is the instance of this unanimous um, vote. I can wrap that into a live object, which gives me a more structured view of the internal state of this thing. So I can see that it's a multi-party Boolean de 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 decision value. Uh, nobody has voted yet, and so the decision has not yet been taken. So let's go here and say, OK, let's grab this value, and let's see what this offers. OK, it offers me to vote. And who should do the vote? Uh, Marcus is always a good idea. So I can now see. Um, that somebody has voted, and this is kind of the internal ID of Marcus. I can also show the diffs, so I can see which of these internal values has changed. And of course, the decision has not yet been taken, because if you go back here, you can see it's a unanimous decision, and there are two people. And so obviously, I also have, who's the other guy? Bunt, right? So I also have to do a $1 vote bound. And now you can see the decision has been taken. Now, if you... Um, you know, put time limits and stuff on it uh, here, for example, then um, you will get things fail if you do the vote after the time has expired. I'm not going to demo this. So this is kind of the, the totally basic um, thing you can do with these multi-party Boolean decisions. Um, so far, so good, right? Of course, it becomes much more interesting if these somehow uh, are part of a larger, okay, talking about larger, I guess I should make the font larger. So you might want to read this paragraph. Uh, 
a great moment for video. <laughs> but me reading it wouldn't be any better. So this is a um, slightly less trivial collaborative decision, right? So people are trying to decide, should we sell something or not? Um, and then, you know, there's various details about this. And so what this example does is it combines, uh, you know, a functional program here, a um, bunch of helper functions, with some of these declarative uh, decisions and a state machine, right? So here's a state machine. And so the kind of top-level interface, how uh, people interact with this running contract is by sending events into the state machine, and we all know how state, machine works, state machines work. So an event comes in, this triggers a transition, but the transition only fires if a guard condition is also true, right? And then we're in a new state, and we can react to new events. And so, as you can see here, um, you know, we start with these uh, products, right? So we have uh, a bunch of offers, which is a collection of offers. An offer points to a product and has a price. And then here is the interesting thing, because for each of the offers, we create an instance of one of these declarative, you know, Boolean decisions. So we kind of embed one of these, or an instance of each of these, for all the things you want to sell in that state machine. So now the state machine kind of has a global state for the selling of all products, but internally it manages one of these declarative uh, Boolean decisions for each thing we want to sell. And again, always think about implementing this manually. It becomes, I mean, it's obviously not, ro not rocket science, but it's, it is error prone. So, you know, for example, when we want to sell something, then we look here, for example, we vote for, you know, there's a, you, you send that you want to vote this product, and then um, we grab the sales decision object from a map and register the vote, right? That's what we did in the REPL for the atomic elementary decision before. And then we check if for a given, um, uh, if all sells, if, if, if we have decided for all products that we want to sell them, then we go into the selling state where we then expect the buy event and there we check if the price is high enough, stuff like that. So there's two, thing, two things to learn. First of all, expressing this as a state machine rather than procedural code is already, a, a, in my opinion, a step forward because running processes are state machines. Um, and uh, embedding these decision objects makes the elementary, elementary decisions much easier to implement. I want to show you one more thing. Um, let's say you want to do something similar, but you are worried that people are going to game your going to game your your process. Gaming means, for example, a Sybil attack where you create any number of additional identities, and then you know because you control all of them, you can now just create a majority by having these new guys that you just created vote for you, right? So one way of solving that problem is to, for example, limit the rate at which you create new identities. Or more generally, if you think about this decision here, you can limit the rate at which you can vote, right? So you can't spam it and, you know, create a whole bunch of identities, spam with plus votes, and then you win. You can't do that if you limit this. And um, the way this is done here is that you, where is the rate thing? Looking for the rate, can't find in my own code. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ah, here, here you go. So um, you can limit the rate to three like invocations of any of these transitions per, like this is a virtual time unit, right? Three per thousand, thousand whatever, logical time. And um, if more votes come in, the thing returns an error and doesn't do anything, okay? Similarly here, um, many, um, uh, yeah, collaborative games, and this is a collaborative game, rely on taking turns, right? So you have a bunch of 
participants, and then for the game to work, for example, a bidding process to work, you know, player one starts, then player two gets to turn three, four, and then you start from the beginning. You, you can't just, you know, vote all the time one person because the whole point of the bidding process is that person X reacts to the bid of person Y, right? So you have some ordering. Um, and so, again, you can do this declaratively. You can simply state that state, you can simply specify that in this state bidding, um, the uh, events that come in have to be taken like in turns by whoever is sending these things. So in this case, it just says take turns for the players, which is just a list of identities who, who, who contribute in this thing here. And it's ordered, so it's really a strict ordering. And there is a timeout. So if, that's the other thing, if, if, if there is a required ordering through taking turns and somebody just doesn't do anything, this is also a denial of service attack because now nobody can do anything because I should vote, but I don't. Right? So you always have to specify timeout. Like if you don't vote in this timeout, you're either skipped or you're kind of booted out of the whole story. And this is all expressed declaratively here on the level of state. And uh, without going into detail and showing you all these test cases, um, you know, if you don't stick to these prescriptions, then the contract fails. And these things are all based on uh, various discussions we've had with um, uh, blockchain people, because these are the kinds of patterns you typically do implement in smart contracts if they should actually act as a contract between multiple parties. And again, doing this manually by writing it in a procedural or functional programming language is not the way to go, I think. I also don't say that this particular language is the you know, best possible solution, but I think it has uh, a couple of ideas um, where this could go. So, let me go back to my remaining slides. This should be disabled. I don't know why I'm seeing these. This is just what I just talked about for the slides later. So, I have another thing I want to show you. This is a language that my lawyer friend um, implemented. He uh, is called uh, Martin Klosen. He has been uh, general counsel of Maersk. So high-level lawyer in the logistics industry. He at some point quit and decided to learn closure, which is why you'll see many irrelevant parentheses on the next slide. Sorry, had to say this. Um, <laughs> so he, he has, so actually we did several prototypes over the last few years, and the most recent one that he did alone um, is what I'm going to show you. It's, um, we started with a charter contract for ships because that's what he did when he was still at Maersk. Um, and these things are really interesting, but that's a different story. It's full of strange clauses. Um, and so he essentially built an internal closure uh, DSL, uh, meaning, if you will, uh, a way to construct an AST of a model, because that's what you do here. Um, it's inspired by one of these papers I mentioned before, this poet's idea from Simon Peyton Jones and this guy Eber. And there is also a very interesting guy called Ken Adams, he wrote a book on how you express contracts precisely. He did a whole domain analysis about concepts in contracts. Really cool stuff. And he integrated some of this stuff as well. And he built, again, um, a fundamental, as it seems, uh, language. And is missing. Um, and um, an interpreter to play with this stuff. The syntax of the language, of course, is not the final version because it's uh, ugly closure stuff. Uh, I think it's ugly. Uh, Martin, of course, disagrees. I uh, hope he isn't watching. Um, so anyway, what you can do is you can declare obligations and then you can specify, for example, an obligation that you know the borrower, borrower, borrower uh, is obliged to do something to the lender. In this case, it's an action, which is to make a payment of 1,000 uh, dollars and there's a description and there is a time window between which dates this has to happen. Um, and so in other words, he, he implemented this notion of, you know, um, obligation, permission, time window event, um, stuff like that. And then he implemented a, a runtime system in a, in a web application where you get a representation of this tree in a more or less legible form. Here you can see where these uh, strings go to, right? They become these descriptions here. And then on the right side, you have 
uh, the state of the contract, which is essentially a log of the events that happened, right? So it's like a replay log thing to get to a particular actual state. And then um, you can, unfortunately, that's outside of the screenshot, you can uh, submit new events and you can see how the state of the contract changes, right? And so the, we did another prototype last year where we connected something like that to an actual document. Like we loaded the contract document into MPS, we highlighted certain parts, you know, where it said you have to pay 5,000 euros too. We removed the 5,000, made that kind of a template slot, gave that a variable name, and then used that variable in one of these algorithmic descriptions. So you have full traceability from the original textual contract to the executable thing in your tool. Um, so without going into much more detail, um, this could be the starting point of a much more declarative and therefore end user friendly language for expressing contracts. Again, the particular syntax probably needs a little bit of polishing if you want to actually show this to lawyers other than Martin. Um, I don't know how many lawyers there are who speak closure, um, but that doesn't matter, right? I mean, the point is the concepts that are in there. And what he's doing right now is he's taking different contracts he has from different places and contexts and trying to represent them there. And I think that's really interesting stuff. And something like that could be mapped on top of the EMP CL I showed you before, because then you get all these, you know, um, for example, gameplay guarantees and the low-level debuggability from that system, and here you have the declarative uh, stuff on top. And so we are actually looking into <laughs> somehow fitting that into that research project, so we can actually implement this. So a few more words about um, the tooling. The stuff I had shown you before, again, this kernel F stuff is built on top of uh, MPS. MPS is a, a language workbench. Um, should go here. MPS is a language workbench uh, from JetBrains. Who was in my language talk yesterday? All right, so the next two minutes are going to be boring. Um, for me, too, because I've said them many times. Um, anyway. Um, a language workbench is a tool that lets you quickly, allow, uh, uh, lets you quickly build new languages. Um, and a, a particular benefit of MPS is that it supports language modularity. So you can take an existing language, like for example kernel F, and add stuff on top of it without changing the language itself. So these additions, like these boxes with declarative contract stuff in it, they are a, a, a modular, non-invasive extension of the basic functional language kernel F. And that's nice because you can actually literally grow a language stack from low-level functional to you know, various intermediate levels until you end up in a version of the language that Martin built, essentially. Um, um, MPS also supports various different concrete syntaxes, in particular uh, tables. And so if you look at many practical contracts, they're full of tables. Like if this time you know, expires, you have to pay X amount and stuff like that. If you buy a big ship, you have to pay more. So tabular stuff actually represented as tables visually is, is very useful. Uh, this kernel F language is basically a functional language, as I said. We use it as kind of the kernel, the core of various DSLs we've been building over the years. And um, I don't uh, have to mention all the features here, but it's it has some things of closure, for example, when we deal with state, closure has these refs as a way of kind of defining boxes for mutable state. We do that too. We have um, number types, which in the type system track number ranges. So you can specify a number between X and Y, and if you compute something that's outside these bounds, you get a static error, which is very useful for a kind of business DSL kind of things like contracts, because, um, well, it's, it's a kind of error normal people care about. Right, so uh, I should have uh, made this a different order. There is one more thing, um, because um, I talked about how um, a language like EMPCL or Martin's Hyper CSL, I think it's called, um, how that helps with ensuring the functional correctness and avoiding kind of logical loopholes because it's easier to express things. But of course, there is this other problem that if you actually deploy this to um, a blockchain or for that matter, any other execution infrastructure, then um, you have the problem that the ver verification becomes an issue, right? So you have to be able to trust that infrastructure that it kind of faithfully executes your now guaranteed to be correct contract. So, 
this is not necessarily my, my specialty, but I wanted to point out a couple of things. For example, there is an effort by uh, Grigori Rizu, uh, Rosu and his colleagues to implement or describe the complete semantics of the Ethereum virtual machine in K. K is a specification framework, semantic specification framework. So you can prove that there are no, level, no low level errors uh, in the VM itself. Of course, right now the VM isn't like generated from that specification, so th there's that loophole. But I just recently read that they are doing this Iele thing, um, probably pronounced differently, where they are trying to build a, let's say, more efficient, well, they're going to describe the semantics in a way that allows the generation of a more efficient implementation, so that you maybe do have a kind of mechanical connection between the uh, semantic specification and the execution itself. Of course, this is not something, well, I should say it differently. I think it's great marketing for the verification community to hop on top of the blockchain thing, right? Because, of course, these guys have built K a while ago and they've verified all kinds of things nobody cared about. And now they are verifying things everybody cares about. Uh, and so it is for them, I think, a very welcome uh, opportunity to kind of use their formal stuff in practice, which of course doesn't solve their problems, right? So generating efficient implementations from formal semantic specifications isn't something that's done like all the time. So there are still challenges there. There's also interesting stuff going on in Delft um, and Alcofisos group. And then there is, for example, another thing, the, the ERC-20 token has been formally uh, verified and there is things going on in the Ethereum community of formally verifying Solidity contracts, essentially also by integrating solvers into Solidity and certainly very, very, um, verifying certain aspects of the definition. So again, if we go back to this picture, then the lower level, once that is really verified and kind of connected, the implementation connected to the uh, specification, that's the verification part and the languages um, I showed before, they help with validation, right? So it's kind of the summary. Of course, I, I, I had to add this little um, remark that um, this whole verification story is really an old story, right? I mean, ver verifying, verifying the correctness of stuff, it's done all the time in satellites, aircraft, pacemakers, nuclear power plants. Um, and I find it funny uh, when I heard, um, you know, people in the blockchain community that now that actual value is associated with programs, we have to start caring about correctness. And this really shows, um, let's say, a rather limited view of where software has been used in the past. Um, let's put it this way. Um, we recently built something in the, in the medical space where we used this whole DSL story to generate code that uh, deals with um, uh, diagnostics and medicine uh, prescriptions and we did a systematic risk analysis and long story short this led to a relatively complicated uh, architecture for generating stuff and you know measuring coverage and having different generators and two different runtimes for redundancy and stuff like that we did get uh, phase one of two uh, FDA approvals so we're on the on a good path here um, so maybe uh, approaches like this could help also in the blockchain space. So instead of verifying everything formally, you do things like measuring test coverage, running the same contract on the EVM, and let's say in an interpreter in the IDE, like the one I've shown, and if they behave the same way, you have certain you know, probabilities that there aren't any mistakes because you did things twice in two different infrastructures, stuff like that. There's a, a really, really, really big community of people who try to get bugs out of software. Um, so it's r I think it's important to kind of be aware of this. All right, wrap up. Um, there is a little bit of additional reading regarding my particular stuff, like kernel F and MPS and this uh, EMP CL. I did two medium posts that described all of this stuff. And then we have an actual summary. Um, just to recap, in my opinion, contracts, like any other software, must be functionally correct, but because usually it's lawyer kind of people who care about this stuff, the languages need to be accessible to business people, and that's where the DSL story comes in. Um, we need to integrate verification tools, both on the functional level, to find logic errors by proving their absence. That was a nonsense sentence, but I guess you get the point. Um, uh, and also on the, on the level below, to verify the infrastructure, 
We want to give these lawyers abilities to simulate these contracts, play through them, you know, do what-if analyses, because turns out that non-programmers, for them, it's much easier to understand something by playing with it than by looking at code and you know, visualizing what it will do. It's probably also true for programmers, but they don't admit it. Um, also, that's what debuggers do. Um, and then deployment to blockchains is something that gives you non-functional um, properties for your functionally correct contract and other deployments are also useful. For example, deployments that give you a little bit reduced security, but maybe higher throughput. And one particular example here could be things like light lightning networks on Ethereum, where security is a bit reduced because you don't commit everything to the global blockchain in real time, but on the other hand, you can do stuff that you know, doesn't every transaction cost you an arm and a leg and takes forever. All right, I have no idea about the time, but I'm done. Eight minutes to go. Okay. <laughs> Questions? So via the app, we have no question. So uh, Okay, I'm going to answer that. <laughs> okay. um, great talk, thank you. Um, my understanding is a little bit more fundamental, or missing of or misunderstanding or uh, what I'm missing is a link to the to the real world so um, from your examples this is um, the input to all these contracts so this um, executable um, uh, programs is uh, voting but uh, what about contracts that need other kind of information um, so yeah, yeah. for example I have a contract for work and I clean your house and then I get money. How yeah. do you execute such a thing? That's a fundamental problem of all executable law, including blockchains, right? You, as soon as, you're, um, as you connect to the real world, you, know you need what they call an oracle, right? Some kind of proxy that somehow says something happened in the real world. And ideally for certain things, like for example, a payment, if your bank would give you like an API call once a transaction has happened, then this part particular thing could be automated somehow, right? But like, you know, if the contract says the ship has to be delivered to the harbor until X, somebody is going to take a picture and say it's here, right? So this is a fundamental problem, which is why many of the blockchain examples and kind of sweet spots try to deal with things that are exclusively virtual, where you can do everything on the computer, where you can do the checking of presence of whether something happened all in the computer, which of course limits the usefulness. So at some point you have to trust some kind of proxy observer of the real world. Okay, thank you. And I have a feeling that there, as you, as you show, showed in your picture, there are multiple layers in the whole thing. Um, do you plan to have an, another layer as opposed to the MPS-based language on top of the other stuff down below? Does that, make, does that even make sense? You want to get rid of MPS? Yes. Yeah. No. Okay. No, but I mean, seriously. I mean, to be a little bit more serious. Um, although there is no reason to want to get rid to everything. So, um, f this is still playground experimentation stage, and for that, MPS is just perfect. But of course, um, when I mentioned in the beginning that the contract definition phase is where multiple parties kind of haggle and you know, collaborate, you need something that is collaborative, so it needs to be on the browser, which is why either you need something like MPS on the browser, which we're building, different story, or you need a different technology, which is why Martin implemented all of this in Clojure and, you know, Clojure script, blah, 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 browser, web front end. So it's just different goals. It's clear that for something like that to go into production, it's not going to be NPS, right? But that's not my goal right now. Okay, anybody else? Yeah. 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 So, so just to repeat the question for the video, I guess, um, what do I think about um, languages that are, if I understand you correctly, closer to kind of prose text, actual readable sentences? 
And I think this is, um, this is difficult for several reasons. If you let people just write text and try to parse out the semantics, this is tough. I mean, this is uh, prose analysis, semantic recovery. Specifically for contracts, that's a bad idea because you want to be sure what something means, and so that's not the way to go. So you'd have to restrict the kind of sentences people can write. You have to give a very uh, narrow or well-defined structured language. And there is a whole community um, in the requirements space for constrained natural language who do exactly that for requirements, which is a superset of these kinds of contracts. So I think that could work. Um, we have, for example, just one little example in, in, in kernel F. We can associate uh, sentence fragments with functions. So instead of call a function add parens a comma b, you can write add the numbers a and b. And then when you call it, you write this little fragment. And so this makes function calls read like a partial sentence, right? That's only one little step in this direction. So I think this is feasible, but it, 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 the question is how far you go. I've seen languages where when you compare two numbers, you actually write blah, blah, blah is greater than blah, 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 instead of using the symbol. And so I think there needs to be a good compromise between templated natural text and symbolic ways of describing things that we all know from grade school, essentially. Um, so the Dutch tax agency uses a very much sentence reading language for describing tax and public benefit rules, and it works, but it's highly structured. You can only, exp well, only, you can basically express nested if then else decisions, right? I am not so sure how well this scales to all the use cases we need. On the other hand, if you are able to um, formalize contracts into a limited language from permission and obligation and time window and event, you know, like, I don't know, 15 or 20 language constructs, then of course you could provide a prose text like syntax for those. So certainly worth experimenting. All right. All right. Coffee. So thank you very much, Markus. Sure. Thanks.